Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, you don't hear that so much anymore. Praise the Lord. You know, they all got their own way of saying things, but praise the Lord. <laughs> That's my way. You know, it's interesting. I always uh, get this um, response at different times. Lots of different responses. I'm sure you get responses in your day, you know, over different things that have come your way. You know, God bringing to you this day that he's made and caused it to come together for a particular reason, whatever that reason may be. Maybe just because he loves you, he lets you live one more day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a novel idea? Wow, just because he loves you, he lets you live one more day. But uh, one of the things that I've discovered is that when somebody wants to try to make a point, you know, they use my name. You know, they uh, get upset at me about something I may have said or something I may have written and react to it. You know, they choose to observe some type of action or reaction to a situation that they find themselves in because they may have misread or misapplied some particular scripture or some particular comment or some particular statement that might be found on the internet that I might have said, hey, you know what? I appreciate what you're writing, but it's not right. You know, this is something that's misleading people or, you know, causing people to stumble or fumble, you know, and I usually sit down and I'll pray about it, you know, and I'll go, well, you know, I mean, I could ignore it, you know, but God, you brought it before my eyes. You purposed in this day to use it in some way, so what is the reason you allowed me to read this today? And God usually says, because I want you to say something. <laughs> So, I do, you know, and guess what happens, you know, not everybody likes what I have to say, you know, and it's not because I'm mad or, you know, I'm upset, I just say false, you know, I mean, I leave it at that usually, nine times out of ten, I'll just use the word false because somebody that follows me or that, you know, is part of the process of looking at the internet is looking for some information that I give out, you know, I pass out information. I pass out and relate those things that have to do with Jesus and living a life according to His will and according to His way. And to choose to live your life accordingly, you're going to run into and be confronted with all kinds of situations that really, the scripture that says, be ready to give to every man an answer for the hope of the lives within you, applies in a lot of other ways and areas that you may have to make some decisions. And the only way to make those decisions would be based upon James 1 5, where you sit down and you say, You know, Lord, what do you want me to do in this case? You know, and God will tell you. He'll say, Skip it. <laughs> or rip it, or trip it, you know, or do something about it. But you know, don't just, you know, ignore it like God didn't say something to you. Because he does. In every situation, every circumstance, he said, He'll give you wisdom if you ask. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask a father. He'll give you thought. So I can always tell when somebody doesn't like <laughs> what I have to say because they use my name. Now, they may not say Michael, they might not say Mr. Stone or anything like that or Mr. Michael James Stone or whatever. They'll say Michelle or, you know, misspell the word or they'll use my middle name, James, or they'll say Stone, you know, they don't usually use the last name because they know that's offensive. But they'll always, and you can always tell what's coming, because they'll misuse my name. You know, and I got to think, I laugh about it because I already go, well, who are you talking to? And I usually respond that way. It's like, well, you know, if I see the guy you're talking about, I'll tell him, you know, your comment. But I know they're talking to me. You know, they're yelling at me or something, or they're venting their frustrations in some way, some emotion that they want to share in some way to vent it so that I can be the sounding board for them because they feel better once they've written it on the Internet. You know, a lot of people use either Facebook or social media to trash talk or bash talk, you know, or to bully or to bombard everyone else around them with the things that are going inside inside them. And we're told to, you know, have the shield of faith and all these other things, you know, put on full armor of God so we can resist all these different things. Because it's really not the enemy that we're fighting, but their flesh is attacking your spirit, you know, in some ways. Because, believe me, you may not know this, you may not be aware of it, but, you know, let me just say this as the foundation. Use First John, in the beginning was the Word, Word was God, Word was God. As your, you know, kind of like proof text, if you want to take it to the extreme in a way of understanding why and how there could be a spirit behind these words that go out from the internet, from Facebook, from social media, from Twitter, and how they could smack you right in the face, attack you right in your soul, 
hit you right in your spirit and cause you to stumble or bumble or fumble or kind of you know, crumble underneath the weight of those words when they seem to be just words? They're not just words. Sorry. In the beginning was a word, and the word was God, and the word was God. In heaven, the imagery of what we see in heaven is an imagery. It's reality. And so when you see the reality in heaven of a word, it may be more import and content and have more actionable consequence in the physical realm that we live in here on earth than you know of. So there is a spirit that goes behind and beyond what we can see, touch, and feel that is a dimensional reality of the spirit of King, the spirit of God and the kingdom of heaven that is on earth, all about us. As Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is about you. you know, oh yeah, I can't see it, but you know, it's here. And that Jesus is a king of the kings of the, uh, the, you know, king of kings and lord of lords, you know, but he's also king of the universe and he's king of the spiritual dimension. And the universe being essential to all the different realities that we don't know about yet that we will experience. So the point being is this. What you say, your words, what you write, your content, what you actually invoke with a lot of your soul that you, you know, obviously know that your soul, hey, you can't see, touch, or feel what your soul can do, but you feel it, don't you? Not with the sensory perception, but with the internal reception. You feel emotions. There's some kind of connection between this idea of words can hurt you more so than you realize, don't they? If someone says, I love you, you go, oh, wow, that feels good. And you feel loved. Or if you look at them and you go, ooh, wow, check that out. You know, and you go, whoa, you know, and you lust or you, you know, have affection or you have some type of reaction to that instigation of some type of you know, sensory perception through your eyes or through your ears. That's why the Spirit of God says, he that hath the ears to do hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Or Jesus says, you know, if your eye be full of light, how great is the light therein? Because there is a direct correlation between that which goes into you and that which comes out. And so, <clears throat> in the internet, you have the eyes looking at a word that's been going in, and the word is accomplishing its purpose, which may not be always from God, <laughs> and it may be from someone else. So if somebody's mad when they're writing something, don't be surprised if you feel something from that, you know, and it's not just imagination. It's not just some type of, you know, observation of the way that they choose the reality of their words or the fact that they, like I said, misuse my name or somehow, you know, use it in a different way. They can write a word, and I'm telling you that there is a spirit behind it that is communicative through the medium of technology over the wires, so to speak, in the spiritual dimension that comes directly to you, hits you right in your soul, and you react or don't act according to what the Spirit of God does with you, for you, or in your case, maybe, if you're not paying attention to what God is saying about you and to you. And you got to be careful of that, because that's the part that you don't see. It's not a spirit of, or a spiritism, or a spiritualism, but it's the reality of what God is doing in all of creation. The fullness of creation is in that aspect. Body, soul, and spirit, or you know, three different triunity manifestations of his own reality of who he is and where he is and what he is manifested in the reality of our life as we live it today, making made known to us how he operates and what goes on in the world all about us that we don't even realize. Because there's more about what we don't see that affects us than what we do see. Because what we do see is just poor imagery. But what we don't see is probably reality more so than we ever imagined. And that's why being born from above, or being born from that spiritual dimension, or spiritual reality, being born of the Spirit isn't one of those kind of like the Gnostics when they got into their kind of like weird kind of way of looking at things where everything was kind of spiritism. No, it's not spiritism. It's you got to combine all three. Is it true that the spiritual dimension affects the present physical realities? Of course. Is it true that the physical realities can affect the spiritual dimension? Of course. Jesus said, whatsoever you bind on heaven be bound on earth, whatsoever you loose in heaven will be loosed on earth. Simple. Now, it doesn't mean you can run around and play God, but it means you're affected by it. Or, if you put on the full armor of God, not so much so. So, social media, internet, all these things, hey, some pastors have chosen wisely to stay off the internet. They don't even bother looking. They're not even involved in that type of ministry. But 
been on the internet a long time. <laughs> now that I think about it, it's like, hmm, that's been a long time. Wow, way back in the 90s? Jeez. I remember when there weren't Christians on the internet. AOL barely had a Christian section. <laughs> you know, and AOL was the only way to really get on the internet. You know, I mean, was around, and, you know, remember that? That got kind of big with Christian sections, but also got big with other weird stuff. But, hey, the reality of what God is doing <clears throat> in these words, when somebody is venting on you, sometimes will cause you to stumble, like I said. And that's how they, it's accomplished. It really is more so said, believe it or not, in John 1, if you get completely into it, you know, and kind of understand if you wanted to do a really in-depth study and go way out into, you know, not just left field, but up the bleachers and up standing on the stadium and going up into the lights, you know, looking down and going, wow, what a view from here, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, don't fall, because it'd be easy to, especially if you're going up one of those giant, you know, you see those giant stadium lights above the bleachers, that's what I mean by being out in left field, you're really way out there, because Believe me, in order to get where you are with what we're talking about, you really got to be like hanging on a limb. Don't let that limb break. <laughs> it's going to hurt when you fall, if you fall. So come back down, you know, get back where it's safe and found, you know, ground in the Word of God, you know, and be content with what God has given you. But if some of you have been involved in this kind of ministry where you know that the words that people use and the intone, intonation and the inflection and the way that they're Right, arranging them in the way that they're causing them with their emotions at the time that they're writing them, then you know that they go out and go, go forth and they do somehow have an impact upon people's lives. And that's why I always pray about, hey, you know what? I don't, you know, I'm not writing in anger. I'm not writing in wrath. I'm not writing in malice. I'm writing in joy or in love or in something else. But I'll laugh about it while I'm writing you know, because I know how much import these words we use have. Let the Spirit of God use it as He chooses for you. But I laugh about that because I was thinking, as I said, about how people will misuse my name and confuse it on purpose to try to abuse it to the point of causing me to get abstracted or distracted from what God wanted me to comment on. But I always come to the focal point and I always have a reason and God keeps me focused in and zeroed in on what's going to be the answer, pointing to Jesus. It's always about bringing them back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, James 1, 5, and the reality of, hey, you know, maybe you got tripped up for a while, but, you know, turn your attention back to, return to the Lord, look again and see where you're coming from so that you know where you're going. Otherwise, if you don't look back from your starting point and you're drawing a direct line to where you're going to, the trajectory that you're on may wind up being completely off target, and you won't know unless you check where you started from to where you're going and how you're going to get there. And that's kind of what repentance is or turning or changing or rearranging or reminding or putting you into remembrance of those things that the God that the God that our God has spoken to us. And that's why we use devotionals every day to remind us, to inform us, to conform us into what he wants us to do today as he's changing us from glory to glory into the image of his incorruptible son who after all laid for us an example of the faith by doing those things that we're doing today examining ourselves to find ourselves if we're in the faith and working on our salvation with fear and trembling through the realization of those devotionals that we spend time in looking at and looking in the word to be focused in and zeroed in on where God is sending us, what God is telling us to do, and how God wants us to do it. So, when people try to, you know, hit me right where it hurts, you know, for me, it's like, hey, you know, you've been there, done that, it's like, you know, try something else. <laughs> you know, I was like, hey, you know what, I'm not new, you know, it's not like I just woke up today and said, oh, wow, Facebook, how innocent I am, let's go enjoy it, you know, no, I'm sorry, you know, I've been around from the chat room days and ministering to people there. Been around from the Usenet days and ministering to people there. Been around for AOL, CompuServe, all the other you know ministries that were on the internet at the time and we, all of those people that have been around for a long time, used them to the fullest of the capacity that God was using by the way of the Spirit. Look at the way the Spirit of God moved today. Woo! You, know, you made it. You know, and by golly, he kept us standing. <laughs> Even when he knocked others down. You know, And they've gone and they were no longer around. You know, and praise the Lord for what God can do when He uses you, where He chooses to use you as you are. So, in the day that the Lord has made today, you know, let's look at what God has promised us according to His Word. Because when you know someone, you want to be with that someone. 
when you talk to someone, you know, you love them according to the way that you talk to them. Sometimes our words aren't the best communicative device, and so we use tokens of expression, tokens of love. Tokens are ways of saying the same thing that we would say with our words if we said the words. And a lot of men, I don't know why, they can't say I love you. You know, they have a hard time telling their pastor, hey, I love you. You know, hey, if you love burgers and you love your football team, why can't you go ahead and tell your church you love them or tell you know, your pastor or your elder, your deacon, your children or whoever it may be. I mean, I know darn well that there's a man out there that says, you know, I have a problem with the words. And you can find something he'll say he loves. You know, I love chicken. You know, I love Pepsi. I love Kentucky Fried. You know, well, I used to. I think they took the bones out, so I'm not sure if I love it or not. But the point is, is that you can say it and you can mean it. But that's what Jesus wants us to do. If you say it, mean it. In other words, have the emotion as part of your... I wanted to come up with a rhyming word for emotion that just doesn't work because it's just not the motion of my lips right now going in the right direction according to what I wanted to say. But the point is, is that let your words have meaning and mean something to them, not just vain statements. Let the feelings be there too when you say them. Don't don't be a hypocrite, which is the opposite of what God wants us to do when he says, you know, about the words, that the words coming out of your mouth will condemn you, the words coming out of your mouth will bless you or will confirm you. So let them be confirmation of that emotion that you have inside and use your words correctly. That's why he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear, don't judge, don't do all these things because it should be few words because in the multitude of words relax on sin and it's obvious when I am in ministry that I see those things where people use a superfluity of words that they just talk rather than, you know, Christians like to say walk to walk, talk to talk. Well, no, talk is true. It can be true and it could be applicable to reversing engineering you. You could be saying things so that it'll come back to you and that it'll be changing you, you know, and God will do that. So, you know, the walk is the talk, and the talk is the walk. If you commit it unto the Lord, and trust also in Him to bring it to pass, so that His Word would go forth and go in you, and accomplish both to those without you that purpose that He's designed it all to be accomplished according to His Word. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And God's spoken Word will come out, go out, about, around you, and as you hear it, will influence you and change you and make you into the image of His Son. So get around the word, get in the word, and get with the word. You know, it's kind of what we used to say. Kind of like replay that a few times, you'll get it. But in this words we use and meaning the words we use, sometimes we confuse what we use. You know, like making up words for God. You know, it's like there's a cult out there that wants to say Yeshua. You know, so they made up different words because they wanted to be better than the other guy. So they go Yahua or Yahoo. You know, they go yo ho ho and ha 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 he 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 and away we go, you know, and they make up all kinds of stuff, you know, and they get into weird doctrines and weird fables and mystical realities and things that aren't true and they've been proven false, you know, and I always say, you know, hey, you know, don't go there, you know what I mean? You know, I'm Jewish enough to know, you know, my my, my Hebrew, you know, it's like, no, I'm sorry. Yud hey vav hey is yud hey vav hey. Whatever else it is, we don't know. <laughs> Let's go there. Yeah. But the point is, it's you know like Jehovah. Well, Jehovah, you know Yeshua, kind of makes sense. Yeshua is Joshua, which is you know really kind of what Jesus' name is, more Joshua than Jesus. But you know we can go there. You know and Jesus is fine because you know it's Greek, you know, and it's the way that Jesus spoke because they did know more than one language, just like today we know more than one language. What area of the country you're living in, you probably have an ethnic idioma that you use in your language to designate something like, you know, here in California we could say, you know, the Camino Real, you know, and that's like a, a street. Well, it's also the straight way or the royal way or the royal street, you know. The, but, you know, there's words that are in our language that are not of the English language but are communicative still to the same reality. You know, like cool, you know, it doesn't mean cold, it means cool, it means like right on, okay, all right, far out, or it means cool, cold, because if you like enjoy the cold, then guess what, hey, if you're sitting in Saudi Arabia, you'd think it was cool, because that'd be a great word, or you'd think it was hot, and you want to say cool, <laughs> but words in and of themselves have meaning, but not always communicate properly their meaning, unless you put the emotion with them, and when you do, then you cause that unseen thing to happen and occur also, and that's why... I like to use words 
that communicate something we both understand, that we both know and that we both agree on. That we can say, Jesus, and we know who we're talking about. We can say, I love the Lord and He loves me. We can say, you know, in some ways, Christ, you know, it's nice, you know, but it sounds more like, you know, like, well, what is Christ? Is Messiah? Well, is that His name? Well, of course not, you know, so it's like, Jesus says something to me. You tell me you love Jesus, and I go, ooh, you tell me you love the Christ, and I'm like, oh, nice, you know, that's nice. You know, if it, it just sounds not quite the same person I know, Jesus. Because, you see, I know my wife, and I love her, but I don't call her wife. You know, I call her, hey, wife, come here, you know. Uh, wife, I really wife you, you know. I love you. I like you. I, you know, you're really powerful, you know. Here's my term of endearment for you, wife, you know. I'm going to call you wife. It's like calling her woman. You think it's really going to be a term of endearment? Is it something that you love to say to her? I mean, is it something that she loves to hear? No. <laughs> it isn't. As a matter of fact, she's liable to beat you to death with it. Okay, husband, you know, the hubris of it all, <laughs> never mind, but the point, hubris is just a word means funny, um, sort of, but the uh, <clears throat> point of having terms of endearment or loving statements or words that we use to invoke a response that we want to receive is that loving relationship that we have in communication with the person knowing that they like to hear that word and so you grow in the knowledge thereof and you begin to use it more often. And that's why sometimes you know you can tell a person's relationship by the words they use. Oh well you know God loves me. Well you know God does. You know, you know everybody knows God. What, you know, what God you mean? I don't know but you know God does. You know, I'm usually you talk to them for a while and they'll talk about God you know then Jesus and then the Father. Well maybe they might not. They might say our Father or something. But, you know they kind of talk formal. Then that's okay. You know, they may have a formal relationship. They may not be that observation of you know having intimacy. But you see, when you use the word Jesus, you're kind of like getting a little more intimate, a little more real, aren't you? You know, when you use the first name, you're on a first name basis. We used to say, you know, so you can always kind of tell, you know, the differentiation somewhat by that. Somewhat. I'm not saying that there's, you know, you can't use, oh, thou most holy, righteous God, and you know, use 17 pages like in the King James version of the Bible when you look at the very front. Pretty right on. I mean, I think it's a wonderful way to talk, you know, in articulation of the renumeration of all that God is. And, you know, from a Jewish way of looking at it, it's like, hey, man, these are pretty cool. You know? And you state them all. That's awesome, you know. It takes pages to do it, but, you know, it's pretty neat. You know, when you read it, if you ever read it, you know, I have. I said it out loud, too. It's kind of fun. But, hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little weird, you know. But, in using and not confusing our words, when I say to my wife, wife, she doesn't necessarily respond, at least not the way I want to. But if I say, boo boo, <laughs> in that tone of voice, boo boo, I love you, you know, <laughs> and I'm blushing, I hope, you know, boo boo, <laughs> that's why I call her, boo boo. <laughs> Partly because she's a boo-boo. <laughs> she's like, you know, she's cute. She's a little adorable little woman, you know. She kind of like, you know, can't see so good through her glasses, so she'll trip over stuff, you know. <laughs> you know, she's a little woman, you know. And she's tiny, you know, she's somewhat petite, you know. I mean, you know, the older you get, the less petite you are, you know. And boy, women don't like to be told that. So don't tell your wife that, you know. <laughs> Ooh, you know, you'll get into yourself in the doghouse, just like the other guys fell, you know, your words. But... I'll call her boo-boo, you know, and she calls me, you know, whatever she calls me at the time, because she doesn't really have a term of endearment, you know, one word. But I chose to have a certain word that I wanted to respond to her. Because we have this little dog, not like this, but we have our bear. We have this little bear that kind of summarizes our relationship. And it's kind of like a little boo-boo bear, you know. It's like kind of like, you know, like, kind of like Yogi and boo-boo, you know. And it's like, it's kind of cute, you know, and it's kind of one of those things, you know. It's childish and it's foolish and it's what some people call love talk. Some people, poets say, you know, it's kind of emotive, creative. You know, differentiation of that segmentation of the reality of language that we use in order to articulate the emotions of which and which ways. We won't break it down in a collegial way. It's just baby talk. You know, love talk. You know, when you talk to your baby, you go, ooh, boo, boo, da, da, do, goo, goo. You know, and the child goes, what are you saying? <laughs> I mean, they just got, you know, 
They just, you know, are trying to learn the language, and here you are, baby talking to them. No wonder they can't figure out what's going on. You know, it's like, mom talks to me normal, and you're talking to me like a child. But you watch, and you know that's love being manifested. And they talk, you know, and they say, oh, say daddy, oh, say daddy, you know, daddy, da, 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 mama. You know, poo poo. <laughs> pee pee. You know, I mean, that's babies, you know, baby. But my love for my wife expresses itself in words that I want to choose to use, and so sometimes I do. You know, I say, you know, I'm like, oh, boo boo. Or, oh, honey, you know, or, oh, I love you. Or, you know, idioms that you have, and you have probably your own way of saying that to your wife, you know, but you don't walk around saying wife. You don't walk around saying woman. You know, you don't walk around saying, hey, better half, or lesser half, you know. Maybe you do, you know. God knows. God help you. But having those ways of expressions to our loved ones, we should have expressions to our Father. You see, God loves to be loved. God is love, and God has expressions of love for us. He's going to give you a new name. Really. He might have already told you. Know, he writes it on a white stone, and he's going to give it to you even later on, and you'll figure it out. You know, I personally think that I might know my own name. You know, maybe, maybe not. But in Jewish culture, the name God gives you is what you are. You might have a determining factor about uh, what name God's giving you or going to give you because of who you are and how you are. You may want to change your nature, you know, get born again because it may not be a good name that He gives you. <laughs> I hate to be called, you know, like uh, stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, stupid! How you doing? Oh, wonderful! I'm just so stupid. You just can't believe it, man. I live up to my name every day. You know, I'm stupid. You know, well, okay, you know. I might be called Isaac because I laugh a lot. Who knows? Laughter. You know, maybe. I don't know. Could be. You know. I think Isaac would. Yeah, laughter because of the uh, fact that, you know, Sarah laughed when she said that she's going to have another son. You know. Laughter? Yeah. I have to think about that one for a minute. Yep. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So, <clears throat> maybe I'll be called laughter. I don't know. But. In Jewish culture, you were only named according to what you were going to become, and you fulfilled your destiny according to the word of God that was given of your name, and that's why Abraham became Abram, Jacob became Israel. And if you notice that God spoke to Jacob, sometimes calling him Jacob, sometimes calling him Israel, according to the way that he was acting. Okay, Jacob. <laughs> ah, Israel. See? Sometimes, you know, your mom probably did the same thing with you. Charles Duke and Heinrich Smith, you get over here. Well, that's kind of like pretty serious talk, you know. Or, Charlie, you know, see the difference? And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to have loving relationships with each other. Now, I don't recommend you going around calling each other, Oh, Dicky, 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 <laughs> or Oh, Freddy, 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 you know. But when guys get together, sometimes they have nicknames, and sometimes they don't use them the right way, and they use them in a negative way. But there could be a positive thing that you could be doing if you used it in your relationship with your Father in Heaven, with Jesus. Maybe with the Spirit of God, too, but we won't go there. That's kind of a different thing. But, you know, that's something that God wants the intimacy of our relationship to be made manifest by how we use our words. You can always tell a Christian who's in love because he uses loving words. You can always tell a Christian who's been changed from what they were to what they're becoming because they use words of endearment, of empowerment in a way. I mean, I don't want to get to this empowerment coaching thing because it's kind of like stupid because it's only one part of life. But they use words that give life and are life and that are meaningful and have great devotion and emotion of the love that God has for us. So when you're learning to live with God, use words that are powerful to leading you to Him and expressing your love for him. Since we're going to get abstract and distracted, let's just end it with that thought and that concept and we'll leave it as a perspective. Always use respective ways of approaching God as we're told in the Our Father but also include what Jesus said about the intimacy of knowing your Father. If you know God, use terms and words that 
demonstrate your love for Him, that remind you of your relationship with Him. Choose to evaluate how you're using your words, what kind of words you're writing, and what type of ministry of the Word you're accomplishing by the very words coming out of your mouth, the things you're saying, the things you're hearing, allowing them to come into you, the things you're seeing, what you see on the internet, and also those things that of the Word, by the Word, and through the Word are being made known of what you are. Because your words literally are going to condemn you. And your words also are going to justify you. So, in a way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God.